In the Clive Barker podcast, longtime fans Ryan and Jose interview guests, bring you the news, and take deep dives into Barker related stuff. In episode 465, we dive back into the Boom Studios Hellraiser comics with Bestiary 1 through 3. Before that, we get into some Hellraiser and Barker book release news. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and advocate of his art, but Don's unique and inspiring paintings are for sale, and over 50% of the proceeds go to the Arts and Medicine program at the Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's even a paver in Washington, D.C., representing Celebrate Imagination. We're thrilled that this worthy cause is sponsoring our podcast again this year, and we hope that you'll consider looking over his Pinterest page and commissioning a painting of your own. For commissions, Don requires no money down, and there will be no obligation on your part. You can also head over to the Etsy shop to buy one of his books, like A Chimney Sweep's Tale, Celebrate Imagination, or The Imaginaries. Follow the link in the show notes, or click on the side banner, and let's see what's new with Don Bertram today. Take a look at Don Bertram's painting, The Descendant, on his Facebook page, and also check out his videos going over the original painting, The Bug Brothers, by Clive Barker, and his intro to the 35th anniversary screening of Hellraiser. Of course, the best way to support this podcast is through our Patreon at patreon.com slash barkercast589. Our subscribers will get exclusive access to content not available anywhere else, like our Collector's Corner video series, rare Barker videos, and early behind-the-scenes stuff. Plus, backers in the $10 tier will also be able to choose an episode topic, and we might mail you something once in a while, depending on your location. Our supporters also get access to the exclusive channel in our Discord server. We'll be forever grateful if you consider helping us out and subscribing to our Patreon. So what's new on Patreon? Shout out to our Patreon members, David Anderson, Eric Vandeholt, Daniel Elvin, and Amanda Stewart. And of course, our returning sponsor, Don Bertram Celebrate Imagination. So what's new in Patreon? Well, we have the BarkerCast Recap, a conversation with editor and author Stephen Jones, which was our previous episode, which is a... You know, was got excited about that interview once it was over and wrote up a long blog post about his his feelings about it and, and uh, kind of a teaser for the episode. So that's on there as a Patreon special. It's going to be on the blog soon, but for our paid subscribers, it will be there a little early. Also, we've got the process of posting an episode, which is kind of my uh, process for putting a podcast episode up. And then uh, coming soon, the Book Club of Blood. So if you're a paid subscriber, uh, please think about what Books of Blood story you'd like to join us on. Or stories. More than one. Well, welcome. This is episode 465 of the Clyde Barker Podcast. And good evening, Jose. How's it going? Hey, pretty good. I'm just uh, an hour after getting off work today. And uh, we decided to... Record a little episode today. We'll talk a little bit about some news, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some comic books. Let's start with news from the Reef. Yeah. So first off, uh, of course, friend of the show, and he's a a guest often on our show, uh, Ed Mm -hmm. Martinez and Nina, have a new interview with Russell FX, who did the special effects for 2022 Hellraiser on Hulu. We've got a link on the show notes there, so you can click on that and, and watch it. Looks like it's had a lot of views already. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a great thing. They talk about it's another part on his ongoing uh, interview with people who work for Hulu Hellraiser from uh, yeah. a few years ago, and uh, it's really cool. I do recommend that you guys go see it. There's a lot of interesting things there. Looks like it's had over a thousand views already. Wow! Yeah, that's pretty good. Hopefully, we'll get it to uh, a few more. Yeah. Oh, and then speaking of Hellraiser, uh, the 18th, two days ago, as we're recording this. It- The 18th of September was the anniversary of Hellraiser uh, debuting in the United States, September 18th, 1987. So how many years is that now? Is it 37? Wow, it's it's been a while. It's it's been a hot minute. I know. So we're going to come up on uh, 40th anniversary at some point here. Yeah. Can you imagine that? 40th anniversary will be in 2027. And that I hope that they're going to do something fun for that. 
Uh, and so I don't know if this is even news, uh, but a Reddit un- user was just hinting at an HD remake of Jericho is coming soon. And he said, there's no announcement yet. And so I was like, well, are you those, is this that Russian group that's been talking about this HD remake of Jericho for years? Mm-hmm. Or, um, or, w- uh, or was that the Undying? Is that Undying the one I'm thinking of? Uh- I see you here in the comments on that uh, Reddit thread. So I don't know because the only thing this guy posted that I could see was just a screenshot, right? Yeah. And, he, and uh, he's like, he said, Jer- Cl- Jericho, Clive Barker, remastered, and why third person? It's not officially confirmed yet, but it exists. I know something, and I'll tell you soon. I'm happy to share this news with you, ladies and gentlemen. And so, I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's like, yeah, and the the screenshot does show the characters in third person instead of first person, which is what the game is usually like. I don't have any information about that, mm-hmm. and I just Googled it really quick while we were talking, and I couldn't come up with anything. So, I guess we'll have to wait and see what this guy's talking about, if he can give us a, a link to uh, what he's referring to. And my question in there was like, hey, is this a fan project or is this official? And he didn't respond. He responded to other people about stuff. He didn't. He he was kind of dodgy about questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the 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 screenshot that he posted is interesting. I also don't understand why he says why third person. Didn't we play this game in third person when we switch no, between in, players? No, it is in first person, which is a little jarring oh, when your guy goes down and you have to switch to or you switch to somebody else. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I, officially, I don't know about any remakes, so I guess we'll have to wait and see what he's talking about. I don't even. Maybe know this who is one of those the, things. Who owns the rights to this game anymore? Because Codemasters is gone. Yeah, I just literally saw this because, like I said, I came out of work to record the episode, and I, yeah. I missed this one. But well, I don't know uh, if this there's was... anything to look up. I think this is the only news we have is this post on Reddit. <laughs> Right. We got another another thing to talk about that's directly related to Clive Barker. Also, another thing that I found this week, I went to a bookstore, and on my way out, uh, Sarah, my wife, said, Hey, uh, look, Clive Barker. And I looked, and there was a small little display with a few horror books. So the ones at the store, they, they were called Harper Perennial Olive Editions. Are those? They look like trade paperbacks, right? It is a trade paperback. Yeah. So I bought this limited edition. It says Harper Perennial Olive, an imprint of HarperCollins Publishers. The design for this cover is by Milan Bozic. And uh, it, it's it's kind of a weird choice for a Thief of Always cover. It's like a one of those fish that you see in the... In the pond. Out, dark, yeah, out to the side. In of the, the dark the depths. House, yeah. yeah. And reflected on the... Eye of the Fish is a silhouette of Mr. Hood's house. Yeah. And inside, it looks just like the regular paperback with all the Clive Barker illustrations. I think the and, paperback uh, didn't have any illustrations. Well, this one does. So. Yeah, so it looks like the hardcover. Yeah, I mean, I had a paperback that had the illustrations when it came out. The one with well, the... The painting of the little boy running out of the uh, my memory the of house. that one is it didn't have the illustrations. Well, that's that's the one I have. That's the only one I had for a long time. So I obviously knew the illustrations that huh. did come with those. Maybe it was the British hardcover. I know there were some differences between the American and the British. I've so only, the other I only editions, remember looking at the paperback in the store and I saw that it didn't have the illustrations. I'm like, oh, I'm not buying this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this Olive Edition from Harper Collins Perennial, they put out some classics, you know. I mean, it's nice to yeah. see Clyde Barker as part of the classics. They got uh, The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty, Lovecraft Country, uh, The Thief of Always, Dracula yeah. by Bram Stoker, Classics of Horror by Edgar Allan Poe, a book called Bird Box by Josh Mallerman, oh. and two more, The Between by Tanena Reeve Dewey, and When the Reckoning Comes by Latanya McQueen. Every year, apparently, they put out some uh, Olive Editions, and this is the lineup for this year. Maybe they have horror ones in October? Is that what's going on, or, you know, close to October? 
Yeah, this says here that Tarpa Perennial Olive Editions debuted in 2008 and every fall since, with the exception of 2012, 2013, and 2023, they have published eight new books in this series. Well, I, I think those covers are kind of neat. They've they've kind of put their own spin on these, yeah. these books. Yeah, and it's great to see The Thief of Always get another uh, release and be considered a classic. So, so you found that's, that's it, so you found that physically in the bookstore. You didn't have to order it or anything. That's right. I just bought it right there and then. I might have to stop by Barnes and Noggins and see if they have one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's part. It's paperback. So just be aware of that. So um, after that, we are going to get into our main topic, right? So yeah. So we're Hell talking about bestiary or bestiary numbers yeah. one through three is the ones we're talking about today. This was uh, August 2014, right? Yeah. And so be- this, these, these differ quite a bit from the previous Boom Hellraiser comics because they're anthology comics. So each one has three stories in it, at least so far. This one, number one, has Symphony in Red, uh, Desert Fathers, and The Hunted, part one. And uh, so Symphony in Red is by... Uh, ben Mears and Mark Miller. And actually, I got my cover signed by Ben Mears and Mark Miller on this one. Nice. Nice. Uh, yeah, they do the Symphony in Red, and they also wrote The Hunted, Part 1. Yeah. So, and Desert, Desert Fathers. Desert Fathers is by Victor Lavalle, Lavalle or Laval? Laval. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, art by Colin Lorimer, and mm-hmm. it's pretty good. I mean, the, uh, mm-hmm. the first uh, c- cover is... Uh, it's like a profile shot of Pinhead. It's like in a bust of Pinhead inside a curio cabinet with a lot of other interesting things like uh, fossils of skulls and goat yeah. mounted goat heads and that moth that looks like it's uh, – I forgot what the name of that moth is. But uh, it's this creepy moth that looks like it's got some owl eyes oh, yeah, and right. some lit up candles. And this is its cover A, which I don't know. They don't say on the inside the, what all the different covers are. Like yeah. This, I don't think they had a lot of covers for this one. And I think this is supposed to take place after all the stuff that we've discussed so far, right? When, uh, yeah. yeah. When there so was Pinhead the War of back. Hell. Yeah. And this is Symphony in Red is the first story. And, and it really is about how Pinhead is coping with his life again as a, as a Cenobite, you know, after his time on earth. Right. Right. So they go back to hell and we see like these, this giant temple and we've got uh, the female Cenobite, right? She's a little concerned because after the hell priest came back, he has not been dealing with his flock. Mm -hmm. And this whole comic is mostly done as internal monologue from the female Cenobite. That's right. This this particular, I mean, this particular story in the comic. Yeah, the Hell Priest is kind of absorbed into working something out in his mind. And he's doing that while torturing some uh, damned souls. And he's he's not stopping, right? He's, he's, uh... He's destroying uh, industrial amounts of supplicants and uh, damn souls. They're saying he's done more in was it an hour, in two days than other people have done in two in in a lifetime or something like that. I think that this particular opening doesn't really match my internal mental canon of Pinhead. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that yeah. he would be doing what is depicted in here. Yeah, and also in the Boom comics, the, the way Elliot Spencer acted and became becoming a supervillain, what didn't yeah. really match my um, ex- my feeling of him from Hellraiser two and three. So outside of the temple, there's a big throng of Cenobites gathering, and uh, I think they want to hear about Pinhead. Right? They want to know what they're mm-hmm. supposed to do now. And they feel kind of lost, and some of them are starting to doubt that he's actually back. I feel like if 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 the Hell Priest was working something out, they could have made it a little more sophisticated here in terms of uh, how he's doing it, because mm-hmm. <laughs> he's just exploding people, like, po- pointing yeah, and at them and exploding them into a blood shower. Well, and he and he start and he starts out saying like, "Hey, you know, it, it's not going to be enough until." I've spilled enough blood to drown another guy. 
right? And so it's like, okay, well, now you've done that. He's like, well, it's still not enough. And she says the thing that creeps her out the most is that she looked at Pinhead's expression while he was tearing apart these damned souls, and he was smiling, right? That's kind of creepy to see Pinhead smile. Right, because he's usually expressionless. Yeah. So like you said, he's just completed the goal of being able to uh, drown a guy into the blood of all the other victims that's gathering up. And she says, okay, are you done? And he's like, "Mm, no. And showers in their blood and says, yes, now I am satisfied. Yeah. So uh, he's going to address the congregation. And that's where they cut off. Yeah. Yeah. And he's all drenched in blood and he wants to go talk to them. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's really kind of of more of a teaser about... And it doesn't... I don't know. You're right. I don't think it really explains exactly what's going on in his head. I just feel like this was an opportunity they could have used to have him like... What I feel a Cenobite would do in his spare time would be... They would be creating works of art out of human bodies, right? They would be doing something that would be like putting together almost like a diorama of... A diorama of like damned souls or or have a project or something not just blowing them up into chunks um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, seems a little simplified for the story yeah i agree and so our next one is desert fathers uh, written by victor laval and art by colin uh, lorimer and so this one this confused me did you did you have a hard time following this one so, yeah, I mean, there's a guy, his job is to gather people arriving to New York, I guess. In and, a hotel, right? Or something? Yeah, he has a shelter, right? So people yeah. who are dispossessed or, or um, uh, disenfranchised, he, he goes over to, is that a bus station or is that like a, it looks like it might, might be a, in Queens, it might be like a bus station of some sort. Yeah. And he's telling these people to go inside and, you know, to, to, and to get into the shelter. if you're a child, don't go on the sixth floor or whatever. Right, right. Yeah. And, and so there's someone in that motel or, or shelter or something. There's people who live in the same building. One of them is a guy, and he's obviously uh, addressing someone off camera. And saying, hey, come in, come in. I got something for us to do tonight. I want you to play with it while I watch. And uh, it it actually is talking about a Hellraiser box that's on top of his bed. And he's addressing someone who's off camera. Uh, Next thing you know, this guy is like getting thrown off the window and and falling right in front of all these people who are going into the hotel. Yeah. So who is that that fell out the window? Is it? It's not the guy in the wheelchair, is it? It is. Oh, it is the guy. Okay. Yeah, he was a doctor apparently. So who and they said, Great. out the window? Yeah, the 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 person he was addressing, I, it makes it seem like he was addressing some girl and say, hey, you know, get on the bed and play with that. She actually came with a boyfriend, and I I guess it oh, probably okay, was the boyfriend it. who threw him out because mm-hmm. they're robbing him, and they think that this box is <laughs> they think the Hellraiser box is uh, is made out of gold. They want to melt so, uh, it down. Oh, my God. This is great. The part that they were trying to melt it, uh, they, they just put the box in like a cast iron pan <laughs> yeah. on the stove, and they're trying to melt it. Yeah. But, you know, obviously, um, a guy shows up outside, and a thunder thunderclap is heard. It's a puzzle guardian. Yeah. Is it Erebor He's, or Eremite? That's what it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You remember the name. Yeah, good, good. Uh, Yeah, so he's there to protect the box and retrieve it. So he shows up and uh, takes his form and uh, kills kills those two people who are trying to to melt the box. Yeah, he he cuts off the woman's head or cuts her head in half. So, like, just the top half flies off with his tail. So meanwhile, and the people who are outside. And he jumps on the guy and just smushes him. Yeah. So the people who are outside are um, – th- this also confused me a little bit because yes. some of these stories, they could have used a little more development in terms of 
who these characters are and what's going on. Yeah, they these, kinda, these guys with hooks with chains, and they're hooking the the Aramite puzzle guardian thing, and they're yeah. pulling on it and saying, "Funny way to get your prayers answered." It's like, who are you people, and what are you talking about? Right. So I was a little confused about this too. I'm not sure who this guy was supposed to be. Yeah, where did they get those chains? Chains. They they look like they're chains from a Cenobite. They do look like that. I was wondering at the time when I read this, I thought that this might have been chains that um, they had gotten off of the dead guy who fell. But uh, no, it looks like they, they're not super shocked about seeing a giant dragon skeletal guardian. No. And they actually are able to defeat him and turn him back into uh, his human form. That looks like a typical derelict. Yeah, but and this is all like, happening. I give you this, will you go away? Yeah, but it, all this stuff that we said pretty much just happens in one page, and yeah. so it's very confusing to understand exactly who these guys are uh, with the information we're given. But mm -hmm. the guy does take the box, and he does nod that he will leave, and he mm -hmm. goes off. But then before he leaves, this guy who runs a shelter goes up to him and says, wait a minute, I don't know if this is something – Something like you eats, but here's some good food. <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay, guys, he's a, a demonic dragon. Why are you giving him a bag of food? He's not just a homeless <laughs> yeah. person. Yeah. Like, yeah, I didn't really understand that. The name of this is called Desert Fathers, and yeah, it just ends like that. They somehow <laughs> defeat the puzzle guardian, uh, give him the box, yeah. and he's on his way, and they're left behind with three dead bodies smeared all over the floor to explain to the police yeah. A story that left me confused more than it entertained me. Yes. Yeah, exactly. The the next one by Mark Miller and Ben Mears is way more straightforward. Yeah. The, uh, the Hunted Part 1. So this is the ongoing story that they will have for a few issues, right? So this yeah. is – you got some self-contained anthology stories and then you've got this thing, which is Pinhead is – about to take care of a guy who opened up the box. And he says, no, no, this is a mistake. I didn't mean to do it. And then he's like, all right, well, I guess, you know, we got we to gotta take you to hell. And then the guy kind of jumps and says, drop it. And it looks like there's a weird cage of metal with yeah. symbols etched all over the metal, right? That they keeps drop it Pinhead. Down on top of Pinhead and trap him. Yeah. So in and the they comics. they him up with like. Guns with the uh, AK-47s, it looks like. Right. But before that happens, I was going to ask you, I mean, we've seen in the comic books that there's things like the glyph of the salutant and all that stuff yeah. that could take away the Cenobites' power or make them mortal as long as they're mm -hmm. inside the – but this – they didn't use any of that in the story, right? It's just this weird cage with uh, – I imagine it's an alloy or maybe it's a symbol mm -hmm. etched into the cage. So I didn't really understand how this connected to what we had seen before in this comic book series. I don't know either. And it's not really explained, but I am I just had assumed it was something like the glyph of the solutant, you know, that was sort of yeah. etched into the, into the sides of the cage so that it would sort of form a, a barrier around him. Anyway, it does look like it's the same effect. Because yeah. when they shoot him with the guns, like you said, Pinhead just gets shredded <laughs> yeah. and falls down to the ground bleeding. And so these guys are like, is it dead? Let's see. You dead, devil? You know, and they're and then they're kind of poking at him. And, and then they have a plan to start prying his pins out of his head. Right. They claim that they've been tasked with uh, getting his pins, right? I think... They get we'll find out in the next episode. A pin from some mystery, yeah. mystery benefactor to start pulling out his pins because he says, "Let's get rich." <laughs> and the next issue, they actually give us a number of the pins that that they take out of Pinhead. And, um, yeah, and I'm sorry, and I didn't have time to, to go Jeff back. Portis knew the number of how many pins there are, and I wonder if they match up. That's right. Do you know what episode we mentioned that? Because I wanted to go back and see if we could our, find that. Um, that was in our episode 300 with the the trivia questions? Yes, yes. So episode 300. 
Yes, in Hellraiser, how many pins are on the head of the lead Cenobite? 106, thanks to Ed Martinez and Jeff Portis. Nice, yeah. okay. So that's the uh, f- from the actual guy who created the makeup. Um, yeah. So this is interesting, right? The idea that Pinhead gets his powers from the pins that are embedded into his face. And, and yeah. had they brought this up when Kirsty became Pinhead, right? Because he, he removed them and put them in her head. That's right. So I think this makes the pins seem like some sort of uh, almost like a crown thing, right? Yeah. Like when the the popes used to have a, like a triple crown and stuff, that's what – the pins are what gives Pinhead his power, I guess, in this new series of comics. And it seems so, like a pretty easy way of getting to Pinhead. I just wish they would have told us a little more about how they did this, because that cage, it's just, it's hard to understand why that worked. They say 138 pins in the comic, instead of 106. Or issue two, we should probably go uh, from the start here. We have Old Hat to Raise the Devil. Hellbound Desires, and of course The Hunted Part 2, which we just talked about. Um, so yeah, Old Hat to Raise the Devil. We got opens up with a blues singer playing a guitar, and he threw his hat out into the crossroads. Oh yeah, this is such a good story. I know, I like this one a lot. Written by Christopher Taylor. All right, yeah, the cover for the second issue. Uh, my cover has Pinhead in a close-up, looking through some sort of grating. I think it's when he goes to the Vatican... And he's looking out of the grating to the bishop talking to the guys. But he doesn't. But he has the pins in his head, which he shouldn't have. Yeah, some of them are torn off. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, all right. My, so my cover is signed by Mark Miller and Ben Mears again. Also, I really like the first story that opens this. Right, the guy who's uh, yeah at a crossroads, and yeah, he's this, trying to. This one more more than men, many of the other ones really feels like an old '90s Hellraiser comic story. Sure does. This yeah. was written by Christopher Taylor with art by Jason Show Alexander. This guy is at night. We see a crossroads and an old car stops in the middle of the crossroads right on top of the guy's hat. And uh, he says, hey, you ran over my hat. He's like, well, what was in the in the middle of the road for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, he realizes that the guy was at the crossroads to try to make a deal with the devil. Yeah, like um, that old he, story with the violin or yeah, the fiddle player. Yeah. And so the guy tells him that he's trying to make a deal uh, to see his sweet Clara. Um, he yeah. wants to bring her back. He, well, he says, yeah, he just wants to see her one more time. But then it seems like it kind of escalates. And later he's like, he, he he feels like he's earned to be able to, you know, be with her forever. Yeah. So he, this is kind of like a... a Ben Johnson, not Ben Johnson, is it? Uh, Rob, yeah, Bob Johnson. Yeah, Robert Johnson. This is kind of a Robert Johnson analogy here. They even bring it up. You know, things didn't turn out too well for Robert Johnson. Yeah. And he says, play me something. This big, tall guy who just stopped his old truck. And this is supposed to be like in the 20s or 30s? It's Yeah, or I think it's in 1940 at the start. Okay. Yeah, 1940, go. somewhere uh, between the Mississippi and the Yazoo Rivers. While this guy is playing his song, a uh, string breaks, right? Yeah. And the guy goes back to his truck and says, hey, I think I can help you with that. He yeah. grabs a guitar case and throws it at his feet and be like, yeah, got this from someone who owned the debt. And uh, I've never I've never seen a guitar with 13 strings. And the guitar looks like a lament configuration guitar. It sure which, does. Yeah. And which makes oh. kind of makes you think that this guy is not human. That he's probably a puzzle guardian. Well, yeah, in the story right now, that's where you start getting your doubts that, uh, oh, wait, mm-hmm. maybe he did get the answer he, he wanted at the crossroads, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he says, there is a bone slide in there, too. Do what you got to do, son. He's like, wait, why are you giving this to me? It's like, it belongs to you. It always was. Yeah. <laughs> and he finds out that playing that guitar will actually... Some of the Cenobites, right? And, and they, he they says, show up on. Well, it's cool. There's a really cool panel where you see the because he's sitting at the crossroads, and there's one Cenobite in each of the roads with the crossroads in between them. Right, and it's the Hell Priest. It's the female Cenobite. It's Chatter, and it's. Uh, and I have to say, I, I love the art on this one too. It's illustrated by Jason Sean Alexander. 
he, he tells them that he wants to see his sweet Clara, right? But he, mm-hmm. uh, the Cenobites don't deal so much in souls. They deal in flesh. Mm-hmm. So they're getting ready to drag him to hell. But I think what happens is he makes a deal with them. And he says, what if I got you more flesh? Yeah. So back in the day, these musicians would travel from city to city. And they would go into these places called jukes where they would yeah. play music and people would give them money. And he's touring with his 13-string Hellraiser guitar. And every yeah. juke that he goes in... They kill uh, everybody. Yeah, the Cenobites come when he plays the guitar, and they take all of the people in that juke. Yeah. Which is interesting. It's also interesting because it's 1940, so it's a long time ago. But it's still after World War I when, when uh, you know Pinhead would have joined up. Oh, for sure, yeah, because that was yeah. like before the 20s. So they said, well, there is one final payment to be had. And as a gesture of goodwill, the hell priest summons Clara. And he's like, he runs at her, right? He's, he's like, oh, my God, baby. And then we get the shocking reveal that yeah, yeah he that was he actually was the one. person and he, he beat her and he shot her? Yeah. Because he was jealous and he beat her and he shot her and made her life hell. And he only appreciated it once she was gone. Yeah. And he says, I want to be together with you forever. And the Cenobite girl's like, yeah, well, lovers should embrace. And yeah. this, uh, not chains, but um, like barbed wire or something, starts mm-hmm. wrapping itself around the two lovers. And as as he tries to kiss uh, Clara, she bites him in the lip and they become, you know, bound together. She She's biting at his face and they're going to be like that bound together in hell. Yeah. Although it kind of begs the question. It's like Pete Atkins said about Larry, right? What does she do to deserve being in hell or all these poor speakeasy customers? <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> I, I, you know, we all have our little head cannon uh, in yeah. our head about Hellraiser. Mine yep. still drinks a lot from everything that came before Bestiary and and the Boom yeah. comics. So it didn't really make sense that they would be able to bring Clara out of the void. I mean, yeah. I don't, uh, I don't think they had any pull to be able to bring her from wherever she was. Yeah, but it's a short story, and you know, I, I don't know how much the people who wrote these stories knew about all the mythology of Hellraiser. So. I guess it's going to be inevitable that some writers are going to make stories that probably don't fall exactly onto your head canon, yeah. like this one. And then the next one is Hellbound Desires, which is kind of it's uh, hinting at a, a like a snuff site called www.hellbounddesires.xxx. Oh yeah, and there's a a girl with the pigtails, and. She's just sitting in a chair, and it looks like it's just from the point of view of a camera, right? Yeah. And so they make her take her clothes off and and start trying to solve the puzzle box while they look right. on from another room. This is the one that was written by Ben Mears and illustrated by Amanke Nahuelpan. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, that this art is fine. It's not as good as the last one. Yeah. I'm, I'm just loath to call this a story because it's not really a story right it's more like a slice of life that they just put in here it's basically one two three it's just three pages yep and it makes us think that okay this is going to be a fetish site and she's a model and uh, she says she's gonna do a little bit of bdsm and instead they give her a box and they keep filming her and they tell her to take off her clothes and play with that and she manages to click something of course we know what's coming she opens the box and in the beginning, they said, you know what your safe word is, right? And she says, yes, it's red. And so the chains come out of the box, and she just starts yelling, red, red, red. And, yeah, and, she's and the like, chains ah! just yeah. Yeah, tear her apart. And there's the guy who probably owns the website, and he's like, <laughs> actually, that's what I got the idea for. I, th- I thought this was the guy who is talking to her while he's filming. I think so. Um, but I'm not sure now if this is just anybody who watches the video from this site. Well, Pinhead's pointing at the camera. Yeah, right? I think, and he's I think pointing this is at the, the guy, guy who's watching, and yeah. the guy is like, "Huh," and he turns around, and there's hooks and chains behind him. Right, because it goes to that. It's not 
hands of call us it's desire but in yeah, this one they, take for they kind of messed that up by killing her first you know they wouldn't have done that yeah. to tiffany so they come in and he's looking at the video on his monitor and pinhead points at the camera look back mm-hmm. and he kind of looks back and there's the hook slowly coming down in the panels yeah. right behind i mean it's cool but it's not really a story i mean not not in no. the sense that uh, uh right. it's just kind of like a yeah. A slice of life thing, I yeah. guess. It's short. Yeah. And then, th- then the next one, of course, is part two. The Hunted Part Two with by Ben Mears and Mark Miller. Same artist, uh, Carlos Magno. Very detailed art, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's got kind of very, an very orangey uh, hint, uh, hue to it or pa- color palette. Yeah, the colors are pretty good. So yeah. in this one, they're they're still uh, holding Pinhead uh, as he bleeds on the floor, and they are trying to remove the pins, but somehow they're really hard to get out. So they start carving them out of his face. Yeah, with a saw. Yeah. Uh, what's or, funny or is that like a, all... a survival knife, I guess it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those knives that has like kind of a hook on the tip that you can use to pull a nail out of, like the wood. Yeah. And so they're yanking those out. And like you said, they count 136, 137, 138 pins. Yeah. At 100,000 a pin, that's $13.8 million. So they're super yeah. happy, right? They're like, all right, let's go and uh, let's go collect our money. And what we were told to do to the body is just purify it with fire. So they pour gasoline on Pinhead. Yeah. And they ask him, do you have any last words? He says, take your time. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> throughout this whole thing, uh, in the beginning, they were always – they're all, he was also telling them uh, – If you're going to torture uh, me, make it slow. Make it slow, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they set him on fire. They go out. And we find out that they're actually in Italy. They're in the Vatican. Yeah. So they're almost across the street from like a basilica. Pinhead – manages to drag himself on fire out of that warehouse and he puts himself out, loses an arm in the process. Yeah. And we see him walking out of this building into the uh, St. Mark's Square in Vatican mm-hmm. City, Italy. And he's going to find out where these guys are taking his pins. Yep. And that's the end of that issue. That's issue number two. These issues, they, we probably could have done all six of them in one episode. They're really quick and easy to read. Yeah, this one, my cover has some hands holding candles, like church candles. Yep, that's and, the one uh, I have, uh, too. That's yeah. uh, cover. It doesn't say. Maybe there's only one cover. I think at this point there was just one cover for the yeah. regular ongoing issues. We've got three stories in here. It says Puzzled, written by Ben Mears, illustrated by Akiel Guzman, and colors by Matt Battaglia. Yeah. And then we got Conduit, written by Ed Brisson, illustrated by Alexis Zirit, and colors by Felipe Sobrero. Mm-hmm. And finally, we have the ongoing The Hunted, Part 3, written by yeah. Ben Mears and Mark Miller, illustrated by Carlos Magno, and colors by Matt Battaglia. So this first one, Puzzled by Ben Mears, really has the – it also has that feeling of the 90s Hellraiser comic. But it's also kind of – it's a similar story to Tiffany in Hellbound. You know, you've got a kid that's obsessed with solving puzzles. Well, yeah, but it's also a, a nonverbal kid. Um, yeah. I, I wasn't Tif- too Tiffany crazy about non- this one. Tiffany was nonverbal also. Yeah, but it looks like something happened to her that made her how we see her in the Chouinard Institute, right? That there was yeah. some sort of surgery that Chouinard did to maybe make her nonverbal. Oh, is that what it was? Oh, because she saw her mother getting sur- surgery on her? But not just that. I mean, in the flashbacks, we do see Tiffany with clamps on her head and that hood. Looks like she's about to go into surgery. Oh. Yeah. yeah, you remember that? Anyway, I wasn't yeah. too happy with this story because they make it seem like this is a nonverbal autistic kid who is constantly having meltdowns. Like his natural state is just meltdowns. And he only stops when the father gives him a puzzle to work. So he spends tons and tons of money on puzzles and the kid will never do the same puzzle twice. 
And after a while, he's even tired of puzzles in general until he finds, he joins like a, a user group or a website or, you know, community or whatever. And That's finds right. gets a hold of the puzzle box. The most sophisticated and difficult puzzle box ever made. Yeah. And somehow he gets the package like next day delivery. Uh, there's a little panel here on one of the pages where he's he's in his house. He opened up the package. He's looking at the box. And there's like broken stuff all over his house. Blood smeared on the walls from the kid. And it's, it's, it's a little over the top. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I don't think there's anybody that's on the spectrum that will actually be this bad. But he gives him the box. And the kid immediately calms down. And he starts focusing on opening the box. And he won't stop until it's open, right? Yeah, so he opens the box and disappears, and the dad comes home. And now, and then they kind of cut to the police questioning him, which, you know, why, why wouldn't they? Of course, because yeah. the kid disappeared, and all that's left in his room after the screams is a puddle of blood. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they're asking, a box abducted your son? That's your story? This is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, tell us where you hid the body. And, and he's like, please, just believe me. It's, it's, it's I don't have it. Mm-hmm. And then they cut to show Pinhead in hell. He's just finishing working on a, a sinner. And he, I don't like the way they call him sinner. Uh, yeah. I would probably say a tortured soul. And he says. And he's tearing him apart with chains. Yes. And he says, please kill me, end me for the love of God. And it's like, okay, all right, your wish is granted. He tears him apart into little pieces. And then he says, come, apprentice, piece him back together that I may resume his torments. And we see that it's the kid. But it's the yeah. kid turned into a Cenobite. And he's going to start picking up the pieces of the tortured soul. And he smiles as he starts putting them together. Puzzle. Yeah, it's a little messy up. Title. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I don't know what to think about this one. I wasn't uh, too crazy about it. Mm-hmm. The next story has some really wacky looking art doesn't it yeah it bugged me i have to say that i had trouble being able to follow it just because the art bugged me so much it's conduit right uh yeah. the art by alexis zirit it's um i wasn't crazy about this it looks like yeah it's definitely very stylized it's got very thick lines it looks like it's made with a big marker mm-hmm. it's kind of chunky art yeah and the story itself was not particularly easy to follow either. So, Yeah, and I, I think the idea is that he keeps believing that his ex-wife is calling him and telling him stuff that she's going to end up actually saying in the future. Yeah, so he keeps, keeps getting these nightmares where he sees a presence whisper to him, though, please stop, please stop, and then... When he finally has that nightmare and he sees who it is, it's his ex-girlfriend and she's like stabbed in the stomach and she's dying. And he wakes up and we find out that what he does for a living is he's working for some kind of company making uh, 3D models, maybe toys. And he's doing a 3D model design of a cube that looks very suspiciously like the Lament configuration, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And while he's talking on the phone, telling, yeah, the design is almost done. We'll be able to send that to the 3D modelers. And yeah. and then his computer starts playing this video of his girlfriend. And he he runs out and he starts calling his girlfriend saying, what are you doing to me? Yeah. What the hell are you trying to do? Leave me alone. Why are you sending me these weird videos? And then all of a sudden, uh, he, he, he kind of has a beat and things change. And he starts seeing that weird video mm-hmm. everywhere around him in every single, like, advertising screen. It looks like he's almost like in Times Square or something. Yeah. And yeah, this is where the story kind of falls apart for me because the next page is just this scattered series of panels pretending to be like the front of the box with a circle in the middle. And it's just him spiraling into insanity, going into his house and he keeps calling uh, his wife and telling her to stop calling. And she's like, what are you talking about? In the very first page, he called her, too. Or he called her, too. And he said, you called you calling me screaming in my phone. It sounded like you were in trouble. And she's oh, like, that's what, right. 
Yeah. That's the first page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's on the first page. You're right. He calls her more than once. He's yeah. been haunted by this this thing, and he calls her more than once. But so his ex-girlfriend, in a move that would surprise anybody, decides to go check up on him because he hasn't spoken to anyone in three days. Uh, she says, I'm going to check up on him, which always seems like a great idea. Go check up mm-hmm. on your ex. Yeah. At night, just before midnight, her parents are like, you're leaving now? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I just want to get this over with. She yeah. goes over to his place, and I guess she lets herself in. Says, Phil, yeah. I just want to make sure you're okay. Hey, It's like, ah, leave me alone. And he stabs her because he was huddled up in his house going crazy. And he ends up fulfilling the prophecy that he's been seeing, that he – that she was going to get stabbed in the stomach and she was going to be yeah. yelling at him, why are you doing this? Please stop. Yeah. And that's it. That's the story. Yeah. Um, and then you see the female Cenobite sort of hovering over him with a puzzle box in her hand. Yeah. Not not, not the best written story for me. I mean, again, yeah. this is not really a, a, a story that makes a lot of sense. What? Because he was making a 3D toy for a company that looked like the box. That's why he opens the gate. Yeah. But why would he be getting these prophecies of what's going to happen? <laughs> right. it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's a weird thing. I mean, Bestiary only went for four, six issues. This story didn't really hold me as much as, as other stories in this series. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, we have The Hunted Part 3. Yeah. This, it uh, opens with Pinhead sort of uh, walking. He's still, he's still got smoke coming off of him from when he was on fire. Uh, sure. He's walking towards the uh, St. Peter Basilica, maybe. Mm. And uh, meanwhile, I mean, I don't know what time of day this is supposed to be. This square is always crowded with tourists. And and right oh, now there's yeah. nobody here. Yeah. So it must be late at night. Yeah. The firemen come over to put out the fire in the building he just came out of. And in the confusion, he goes back into the building that's on fire yeah, this part confused me too i was like why is he going back but he says he he calls it providence and yeah i guess he it's like there's a hole in the floor that he jumps through or something he falls through right okay. yeah it, 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 it oh no he jumps through yeah so it's, it's a little hard to understand what he's doing but i guess he went back into the building because he was afraid the firemen would see him so he jumps back into the the, the burning f- building, which is kind of falling apart, and he gets, you know, trapped under a bunch of rubble. He just mm-hmm. says to himself, "This is not how I die." Okay, yeah. if you say so. But then he, he goes like, "Oh, I can smell something." And since There's he fell like a through that, skeleton in there. Yeah. So. He finds that when that building crumbled, he fell through the floor into a galleria of sewers. And he's he's following a smell. It's not the smell of the skeleton. He says he says he smells his blood. So I guess he's like he's like a bloodhound sniffing his pins to see where they are. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, he finds himself looking out of a, a sewer grating that leads into the basilica, and he sees very conveniently uh, the. The bishop and the the guys who are giving him the the pins, and they're saying, "All right, where's our money?" and and that's the end of this issue. I'm, I'm yeah. I gotta say I'm a little I'm a little frustrated that basically this story is he just got out of the house, then he went back into the house and he walked a little distance and he's looking at the guys in the basilica. That's yeah. all that this story did. Yeah. For this particular yeah, it, chapter, it didn't advance it very far. I, I used to grow up watching uh, reading magazines like Heavy Metal, the French version, and stuff like that. And I'm not a stranger to serializing stories where you buy an issue that will have like three parts of a story, and then next week or next month you buy another one that continues it. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, you know, you can read the whole thing through. But usually there has to have more stuff happening when you're serializing a story. You can't just move the story like two steps and then just. Say okay, now you got to wait for the next month to know what's going to happen. Yeah, um, that's one. That's one of the things that I thought that this ongoing story with bestiary was a little unsatisfying because n- very little happened. Right? In I can't each chapter. remember if it lasts the whole six issues. Yeah, me neither. 
but I guess we'll find out. I did read yeah. uh, the issue four, and I left issue five and six for later. But uh, we're just okay. discussing the first three today, so yeah. it's nice to see that they at least try to bring in the Vatican into this. Uh, that's that's always an interesting uh, trope mm-hmm. to bring into a story that involves hell, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm in, I'll be interested to find out, because I don't remember, to find out why this bishop wanted the pins in the first place. Like, what was he going to do with them? Yeah, they're they're treated like some sort of uh, power relic, I guess. Maybe that would uh, allow the Vatican to hold some sort of power over uh, hell. I guess yeah. we'll find out more when we read uh, issue four. One thing yeah. we didn't mention is that these issues also have special thanks to Gareth Barker and uh, Vicky Barker. Oh, so yeah. Gareth is Clive's nephew and Vicky is his wife. Was. Was. or Yeah. Right. And they also worked, uh, I think they also worked in that Book of Blood animation, right, for Made Fire? Yeah. And I guess they, uh, they also contributed to make this happen, apparently. We uh, yeah. almost submitted a story to them, right? We just were not storytellers, and uh, we considered the possibility of, of pitching them a, a comic story script, but uh, that just never really happened. Yeah, well, and, and B-Siri is so short. It would have yeah. been, yeah. It, but it would have been nice, you know, to get something in there but, or you know, anthology. The, yeah, maybe I still hold hope that we'll see more Hellraiser comics in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe not in the short term, but uh, definitely this will come back to comic books. I believe, well, and maybe because not it's with just Boom. too good. Maybe it'll be with somebody else, a different company next time. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would really love to see more Hellraiser stuff in comic book form. It's just hard, you know, because Hellraiser is very dependent on the trope of p- person opens box, Cenobites come, twist, yeah. end of story. And these anthology stories, they're not good if that's just they're go- all they're going to show, like yeah. Hellbound Desires. It's just a girl opening a box in front of a camera, being taken to hell, and then the Cenobites appear and the story ends. That's yeah. literally just a trope. I'm going to try to go um, to that website. Albon Desires, okay. <laughs> well, if I never hear from you again, I know what to do. Dot .xxx. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you there's nothing there. can't find the server. That, there, that's not – xxx isn't one of the suffixes on it, on a website. That's right. That's right. I don't think we have those yet. I'll just try but yeah. dot com. So it's been 10 years since this Nothing. comics came out. I'm realizing now. Yeah, yeah, 2014. 2014, so we had ju- we had just visited. That's what it was. Yeah, we had visited um Clive's office right after we went to the screening in July, I think, of Nightbreed. And, yes. Um, so these comics hadn't even come out yet when I got them. They gave them to me and signed them. Uh, one and two of Bestiary. I remember that. We were in Mark Miller's office. Uh, yeah. At that house that I think that house is not with Clive anymore. I think that house was right. sold at some point. But uh, good times. I, I still remember <laughs> I still remember that uh, Mark Miller was having lunch while uh, while he was signing those things. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. He, he had just made one of those meals in the microwave. Right. All right. Well, that is bestiary. And what else, uh, where else are we going to get? To, um, yeah. So at some point up? in the future, like you said, we're going to come back to Hellraiser bestiary and do issues four through six. Uh, we've got the Hellraiser Quartet of Torment, the final disc four. Uh, which we hopefully Pete Atkins can join us for that one. That was a lot of fun when we did it on for Hellraiser Two. New more news and interviews. Jericho Squad's going to come back pretty soon. At the end of this month, we're going to record it, and then like a week later, it'll be up. And then of course the Book Club of Blood, which we've been talking about for a few episodes now. Uh, we're going to get that. We need to get that on the books. Our first one, which will be the ha- we'll be discussing the story, the Book of Blood. Yes, the opening story uh, to the whole series, and you know our, our um, Discord backers can can join us on that on those these episodes. So when we go through the short the books of blood and the short stories and stuff, and you had actually mentioned some you because you talking about rare stories, 
that maybe we could talk about those in the near future too. And I think why not? You know, we could just go through uh, after we get through the books of blood, we could just go through more short stories and just keep doing them. Let's do that. Let's do those yeah. uh, those more rare stories again because some of them I yeah. might not have read and I've gotten them since. Yeah. Please. Uh, tell me to shut up so someone else can talk about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, I would love to hear also, other opinions. W- when we talked about rare stories the first time, there were a lot of them that you hadn't read. And um, right. so I just had to kind of talk about them by myself, mostly. And, yeah. and so this time you'll you'll have a chance to read them. So I think that'll also be good. Yeah, like The Departed... Hermione and the Moon, I think. P- Pigeon uh, and Teresa, I think you did one that you hadn't read. And I think you gave me, you sent me a book for on on Amens Shore, which took and, months and months to get because it got and stuck. I gave in you, New and York. I sent you a book that had um, coming to grief in it. That would be a good mm-hmm. uh, revisit of those stories. But uh, yeah. the next one we're going to talk about in the book club of blood will be the book of blood, and it's just yeah. the first part, right? I, yeah, I've been dreading. I've been dreading putting all that in a title, "Book Club of Blood: The Book of Blood." Ah, in, yeah, in that first one's going to be. It's going to be a, a funky title for sure. Yes. Thanks for listening to our episode today, and and this podcast having no beginning will have no end. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. You can chat with us on our Facebook BarkerCast listeners group, our Facebook page, Twitter, or our Discord server. The best way to support us is to buy our book, The Barker Cast Interviews, Occupy Midian, available in hardcover on Amazon and ebook on Amazon and Apple Books. Fundraiser 10 is all about Patreon this year. Become a patron to get access to exclusive stuff, pick an episode topic, and maybe even get cool stuff in the mail. You can also buy a t shirt on our T Public store. Go to tpublic.com and search for Barker Cast. Leave a message for us using the Speak Pipe link on our blog. Opening and ending music generously provided by Ray Norrish. Thanks for listening.